Hi, this is Ren. And this is Casey. And this is All Walks of Film. That's all there is to say about The Revenant. We're done. Roll credits. What is that? What do you even say about this movie? I mean, like, okay, I was sitting there in the theater thinking about all these little quips I could make and little jokes and all these things. I'm like, ah, but this, meh. But then, you know, you actually are like, okay, let's sit down and talk about this movie. And it's like, when you have a burger in your hands and it's so big that you're like, I literally don't know how to get my mouth around this. I don't know how to take a first bite out of this. And then you're like, I can't eat this burger. I should have ordered something else. <laughs> that's not really what it's like. I wouldn't, not that last part, but that's kind of what it feels like. What the fuck do you say about this movie? Yeah, this movie was absolutely amazing. And before we throw out any spoilers, I will say that if you're in a bit of a conflict and you're not sure which movie to watch, The Revenant or The Hateful Eight in theaters, do yourself a favor and watch The Revenant. Yeah. You can watch The Hateful Eight at home. They're, they're, even though it's in 70 millimeter Panavision, Panavision the, the movie is essentially a stage play. I you know, I'm not going to give away anything about the hateful eight, but I will say that cinematically it's not as compelling as something like the Revenant, which at least for to, my to money, to be fair, we actually did watch the, the Revenant on a Panavision screen. Right. And I mean, <laughs> we you got should so spoiled. You should watch this movie <clears throat> on the biggest screen that you can find mm-hmm. because it, it really is one of those experiences that like you don't get very often. And a really amazing sound design. There was more than a couple times where I le- I actually thought for a minute that parts of the sign- sound design were actually happening around me. I was like, what is that? What is that? And they'd be like, oh my god, that's like nature. But it feels like it's right here. What is that? Yeah, the sound design was very good. <clears throat> yeah. Um, and of course... You have the cinematography from Emmanuel Luzbeski, who, uh, I mean, <laughs> he's probably the best cinematographer working today. I, he did Tree of Life, which, for my money, is the best cinematography I've ever seen. In a it film. was 100% the best cinematography that year. No competition. Yeah. Yeah, definitely not Hugo. Definitely not Hugo. Um, and that's not to dismiss Hugo, but, I mean... Comparing the cinematography, you can't even. Yeah. Okay, so actually getting into The Revenant. Oh, yeah, before we get into spoilers by any means, I will say I I did not watch a trailer for this movie. I did not listen to anything about this movie. I did not hear anything. I can seriously count on one hand everything I knew. It was Alejandro Iñárritu slash Emmanuel Luzbeski. It was Leonardo DiCaprio and Tom Hardy. It was based off a true story, kind of. There was a lot of snow. Maybe there was a bear. That was literally all I knew. I didn't know anything. And after I've seen this, I'm like, somebody could have sat down and talked to me about this and told me everything that happened and it wouldn't have spoiled the movie. But I'm really glad that I didn't see any of that imagery. And all that imagery was so fresh when I was watching it. Instead of plugging it in in my head of, oh, I saw that part in the trailer. Yeah, and for me, I... (laughs) I had seen Inuritu's films like way back when before like he was a big name. I just forgot about him. And then, you know, Birdman was like his sort of breakout film. He did make other films that, you know, got a lot of buzz. Uh, He directed Amoros Peros. He directed 21 Grams. Um, He also directed Babel, which I'm just like, eh. And um, of course, uh, Birdman was the was the film that won him the Oscar. And I will not be surprised if he wins the Oscar again for this film. Well, I'll actually be happy this year. Yeah. Because last year, well, with Birdman, literally the first words out of my mouth were, that was pretty good. That was like eight out of ten, but not best movie of the year or anything. And lo and behold, it becomes best movie. Uh, well, year. duh. I mean, that's just my fucking karma, right? This year, when The Revenant 
sweeps up every single Oscar nomination available when it gets Best Picture and Best Cinematography and Best Director and Best Screenplay and Best Actor and Best Supporting Actor and Best Production Design and Best Costume Design and Best Sound Mixing. I will not complain. I will be so happy. I will be thrilled. And I'm not even saying I think that it deserves it over every other contender necessarily. I'm just saying the Oscars likes to pick two movies. They pick one movie that they give all the important stuff to, like that they like. Then they pick one that they give all of the technical awards to. And then maybe they'll dole out one or two and other ones just because, but there's really only two. And this movie will be one of those two that just gets everything. Right. I will say best editing. I, I'm still going to be furious if best editing does not go for Mad Max Fury Road. That being said, in less than five minutes, you told me cinematography for this is better than Mad Max. Fuck that movie. Well, cinematography. You did not say not fuck editing. that movie. <laughs> no, I did not say fuck not. Mad Max. <laughs> Mm. So I guess we'll get into spoilers now. Um, I will say, The Revenant is the best horror movie of 2015. 100% absolutely. You have human atrocity, you've got murder, you've got rape, you've got body gore, you've got uh, para uh, paranormal activity, you've got really far-fetched crazy stunts that are kind of Final Destination-y. You know, you've got actual terror and panic and it actually has tension and is really scary. This is really one of the scariest movies I've seen in a very, very long time. Like, this movie was legitimately... I... This was... This was a movie where I was seriously, like, hiding behind my hands for a lot of the movie. Not a lot of the movie, but there were certain parts where I was just like, no... No, no, I can't watch. I can't watch. Oh, no. Yeah. I always, whenever I put my hand behind my eyes, though, I always have my fingers open. I can't actually take my eyes away from the screen. But this movie seriously felt like an actual horror movie in the best possible way. Like, that's a huge compliment to the movie. Yeah, um, I'm a fan of survival movies. And after seeing this movie, it's like, what, what can even compare? Like, I grew up reading like Jack London and Hatchet and books about survival. So this is very much a genre that I've, you know, grown up to love. And apparently Emmanuel Lewis Besky has as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it does, <clears throat> it does come from somebody who has a passion for this genre, even though like his filmography doesn't suggest it in any way, shape or form. Mm hmm. You mean, uh, sorry, uh, Inuritu? No, I mean Emmanuel Lewis Besky. I mean, I was comparing it directly to Gravity. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, I was just thinking of his other films that don't necessarily have things to do with survival. But okay. That is an interesting parallel. Yeah. This is way more edgier sheet than Gravity ever was. Um, I disagree, but here's the thing about it. Gravity was very out of your seat, but that's because Gravity came out before The Revenant. If Gravity came out after this, it would maybe stand to be a little bit weaker. But, you know, the, these people have gotten better as they have gone along. That's how it should go. Things should be getting progressively better and better and better. So the fact that The Revenant does it better than Gravity doesn't really mean like, oh, Gravity wasn't close or comparable. This is just an evolution of some things that were worked on in Gravity. Yeah. From the perspective of on the edge of your seat survivalism. I think that there was definitely some stuff that was, here's what didn't really work in Gravity, and let's fix that in this movie. Sort of evolution to it. Yeah, so um, in the film, the beginning was a little bit unclear. I mean, we knew that um, there was this absolutely spectacular opening where uh, you have the Native Americans coming and raiding white settlement. And I, I got to say, the cinematography in this scene was on par, if not better, 
than the storming of Normandy in Saving Private Ryan. And I'm not I'm not putting that lightly too. I mean, this sequence was absolutely astounding. Right. And back to the point of what you were saying about Mad Max, because it was directly after this that you said that. We had watched a video together. We will put a co- the link in the description below because it's absolutely fantastic. And I would like people to see it. It's on Vimeo. And this woman did um, did a Films of This Year video essay about 2015. And she used this thesis of the way that framing was used in all these great films in 2015. And she offered one of the absolute best criticisms of Mad Max and a negative criticism at that. I 100% agree with and I think was incredibly smart and intellectual where she was saying that there's so much chaos and action and, you know, the beats are are so maddening. But then you had this so much control to the cinematography, which was amazing and it was beautiful, but it was amazing and it was beautiful and there was no chaos. It was very strict and tight and controlled and it works in, you know, direct... um, uh, conjunction no that's not the right word uh, juxtaposition it was the exact juxtaposition of each other but not in a particularly motivating way and in this that scene with that raid that was madness and violence and chaos in a framing of madness and violence and chaos that directly hammers home exactly what you're looking at you know what you're seeing but it feels like you're there you, there's all this feeling of you get so tense because you feel this craziness everywhere and you don't know where to look and you don't know what's going to happen. And this, per- like, there's real tension that all these people around you that you literally don't even know and have never seen on screen before are going to get murdered. Yeah. It's and really suspenseful. And, and it's all shot in deep. Done. It's all shot in deep focus. So, uh-huh, so you, you know, see everything. You see everything. Your eyes literally <laughs> can just dart around the screen and. You will probably watch a different part if you're not focusing solely on the foreground. You'll notice like a different part like each time you watch this movie. It's yeah. insane. And that's definitely how much that's definitely something about this movie is I I'm pretty certain I was on the edge of my seat. I was entirely awake. I was so focused on this film. I'm pretty sure I've only seen a third of this film. I'm pretty sure I haven't even gotten half of what I'm supposed to get out of this movie. And that doesn't make me dislike it by any means. I know that there's a lot of things I missed and a lot of things I just don't understand. But that doesn't make me dislike it at all. I just know I'm going to get that the more and more I watch it. But even like what you're saying, going back to Mad Max, like in Mad Max, there, there was another criticism we saw that was like, the reason why the framing is so perfect is because Everything is directed at the center of the screen, so the audience isn't darting and looking around. That is a eloquent trick. Like that's a beautiful bit of manipulation, and it's very simple. And in a lot of ways, I prefer simplicity to like convolutedness. But on the other hand, it takes like I literally cannot comprehend in my mind the amount of skill that it takes to not do that at all. To have this um like back and forth and up and down and all around and everything is here and here and here and deep focus and actually make that not nauseating, not head spinning, but actually very compelling to get that feeling in you without feeling like Cloverfield obviously would be like the thing you would compare it to of like, don't fucking do this. When we describe this, this is not fucking Cloverfield at all, but I, I, I literally cannot even put in my head how y- you plan to do that because there, there has to be there has to be so much planning that well, went into taking those it's, shots it's that I mass, can't even figure it it's out. It's mass choreography. It on is. Top of, on top of that, you have uh, practical effects of blood squibs and arrows and gunfire and stabbings and physical brutality and of course you will have computer enhancements with those but for the most part especially not in this scene was it ever apparent i mean especially because this was another one where it was all one long take but because it didn't have those very smooth transitions from you know still to still to still it didn't feel like that at all. 
you know, it didn't feel like that the way that Gravity and Birdman felt. Right. Yeah, Emmanuel Luzbeski, <clears throat> as a cinematographer, he's taking a lot of bold risks. He's definitely challenging himself and pushing himself. And really, the best thing that we have, I mean, really, the thing that we can take away from each film that he does is he he literally is pushing the cinematic language in ways that we have never seen before mm -hmm. you know he he's an innovator I absolutely agree. and like even this film is an innovation I um agree. partly because they're very except for the bear scene there are very few cutaways or like cuts with, you know, graphic violence and like people moving around and all this kind of stuff. Like usually when you watch films with action, you can see where the special effect comes in. Right. Or where they cut away because obviously you physically can't do this. You physically can't show this because, you know, that would put the actor in danger um and and such but you know look at look at the horse scene obviously there's some cgi trickery well yeah there's so much stuff that the, you know is cgi because it has to be but he but he there, there's you. like a there's like a seamless thing you know you see the horse and you obviously know that's a real horse at one point but then it goes off the cliff and you know that they didn't kill a horse obviously they didn't kill a horse but you're while watching it, you're just like, how the fuck did they go from, you know, him riding the horse to him flying into the tree? The horse dies, um, you know, because it falls to its death. How how do you do that in like one, one take? Mm -hmm. I mean, not one take, but like one shot. Yeah. It It's just, I mean, it's. If you are a cinematographer, if you are somebody who's who loves the art of cinema, like this is an absolute must see. And, you know, like we said, this is our spoiler thing. But like at the same time, even with all of the spoilers that we will talk about, and if you're somebody who just, you know, likes that or whatever, still go out and see the movie. Definitely. You owe it to yourself to just fucking look at these things put on screen. I mean, it's, it's absolutely astonishing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> what really, what else can you even say about this movie? Well, I, I, will, I will say <laughs> we haven't even gotten to the plot yet. <laughs> well, yeah, but I mean, how much of this movie is really about the plot? I mean, yes, it's important, but at the same time, that's not the movie. Yeah, um, Leonardo DiCaprio well, gets attacked by a grizzly bear, um, and they leave him to die, and then he fights to survive because his son got killed, and he's trying to get revenge on Fitzgerald, played by Tom Hardy. Um, that's that's pretty much the plot of the movie. I mean, there there's other stuff. Uh, thrown throughout you know stuff with his wife and stuff with the village and stuff with other native americans but that's like the bare bones plot of the film mm -hmm. yeah um I, I will say one thing that's great about this film is that it it's very hmm how, how to say this it feels very current of our times it's a lot of these innovations that we've seen before there's a lot of very long single takes that don't have any edits to them there's um well there is an edit there but we have the technology to mask it well yes but we we've seen this done before right. you know but it's always so smooth you know it, it's never not used as a camera scroll that's the thing it's always used like um uh, not a camera. I always call it a camera scroll. That's not what it's called, like a scroll shot. It's always used that way. And this is a film that did not use it that way at all. And it was innovative. It really was. Just that one little thing made it 
not one little thing because it was huge, but it was something that made it anyone who maybe thought that um, that Birdman was pretentious for trying to pull that off. Which I, it, you that can... is not at all the feeling here because it doesn't feel pretentious. It, it's it feels it's confident. I, I hes- well, no, it's just I hesitate to say this because I don't want to compare it to the Virgin Spring because I think the Virgin Spring did this quality better than the Revenant, but it feels remarkably not worked. It doesn't feel like overworked and so glorified and so perfect. You know, it 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 works so hard to make this compelling and interesting, but is very rough with the way that it handles it. And that makes it feel a lot more a part of the movie. Like, it fits into the film. You know, I think it would be very... This would be a very different film experience if all of it just felt so smooth. If every cut and every transition and every movement of the camera just felt so perfect and controlled. I I think this would have been a poor movie for it. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. So, um... I mean, I guess we'll get into some of the other stuff. Uh, Leonardo DiCaprio... Okay, I will say, this was a movie where I lost most of the actors. Leonardo DiCaprio is Leonardo DiCaprio. And for the first bit of the movie, you're basically just cheering him because he's Leo and you know who he is. But, I mean, even even if... You know, it, he does very different roles. He's not like a typecast actor, but you always see him. You know his face, you know his voice, you know what he sounds like when he yells, you know what it's like when he slams on a table, you know what it's like when he laughs, and you know what it's like when he loses control. You know, he has these very particular qualities to him, and a lot of actors do. And most of this movie, I didn't see him, I didn't see any of that. I didn't know who this guy was. Legitimately, that was not Leonardo DiCaprio on the screen. It took me an embarrassing long time to figure out who the fuck Tom Hardy was, actually, I mean, part of it was the lighting. Like, once I saw him in clear daylight, I was like, oh, it's you. But it's because that's not him. You know, there's there's a lot of great directing. I really attribute it to direction of the actors in this movie. Not that the actors don't get their credit, but you just can't tell. And You can't see them. And it's really interesting because a lot of the movie, Leonardo DiCaprio is speaking... You know, oh in yes, the native the, tongue. So it, oh yeah, he had to learn a foreign language. Yeah, yeah, and that that offers an interesting layer to it. And his relationship with his son was um, very interesting. Um, yeah, definitely. Because at the beginning of the film, it was a it, it was something that they couldn't bring up mm-hmm. because he didn't want to put his son in danger um with other people and with other people because then he would be viewed as like a brown skin lover or um no he was just trying to keep his son out of danger it wasn't really for himself because he was speaking the language with him and they all knew that 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 relationship was there he was just like dude kid keep it on the down low because no matter what you say they're not gonna hear you they're gonna see your skin you know, that that's very different than, like, he's trying to hide his relationship with his son. I think they all knew that. Okay. But, uh, yeah, it was just... That, that was a really interesting aspect that they put into the film. And done better than a lot of films where it's... White man, you know, falls in love with natives and then, you know, hippy-dippy. This, this movie- was surprisingly not... Dances with wolves and fern gully and smurfy cats. Yeah, you know, like, 5.0 or whatever. There's the so, there so many movies that either depict Native Americans one of two ways, which is Native Americans are fucking savages and they're just fucking crazy, which we kind of did away with after a period of time because it was just offensive. Because then we replaced it with the other, oh, the Native Americans are one with nature and they're... You know, they're so ethereal and they're so, you know, um, you know, hippy dippy, whatever. And then this film really played both elements. It really showed, you know, it it didn't paint them as one or the other. And 
in general, with one major exception. They were good about doing that with everybody. You know, this this definitely had, and there was definitely racism in this movie, too. There was, you know, um, European versus Native American uh, racism on both sides. And there was a lot of warring with that. But then there was also Native Americans warring within themselves and Europeans warring within themselves. Yeah. Because and, that's what mankind is like. We're f- and the general theme of this movie, it's really interesting because you could see on the surface level this being a movie that's about man versus nature. But this movie is man versus nature, man versus man, and nature versus, versus nature. nature. Yes. Because one thing I really loved about this movie is so many movies, including Terrence Malick movies, I will say that, that have nature all... Nature is a soft, beautiful, warm thing, and go out into the nature and become a part of the nature. And this was a movie that was like, the reality is, nature is fucking brutal. Every level of biology is fundamentally fucked up. That is just a truth of life. But in this film, it wasn't, oh, the beautiful purity of nature versus the horrible, terrible industrialism of civilization. It was... The brutality of nature for the means of survival versus being fucking greedy. Yeah, and uh, the human aspect in the film, obviously, was the greed. It was really interesting because the um, the settlers in the movie, the white people, mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> they were so controlling and uh conservative about their pelts that they were literally willing to give up horses just to keep their pelts and it's like how the fuck are you gonna carry these yeah (laughs) like they were willing to put their own lives in danger and not have horses in order to have more pelts but the same thing goes with the native americans too they were doing the exact same thing because this uh this polony chief am, am i right I think so. Yeah, I, okay. So he is so hell-bent on finding his daughter, uh, uh, Pawaka, that he is willing to give up all the lives of all these other people. He is willing to give up the lives of all these men and women. He is willing to give up the freedom and livelihood of people, trade people for sex in order to get the tools he needs to go find his daughter that he doesn't know where she is or if she's alive or not. And at some point, you have to stop and be like, dude, how many lives are worth this one life? And I mean, that's that's something you get in a lot of revenge movies, and this was a revenge movie, and the same thing goes for for Hugh Glass, that's his name. And the same thing goes for him, too. You know, there is the matter of pelts and money. You know, that's that was Tom Hardy's goal. He wants the pelts. He wants the money. He wants the livelihood. He wants to get out with his, you know, his own skin at the expense of everybody else's anything. But then, you know, you have... Um, Hugh Glass and this chieftain who are so after, you know, I have to either find this one person or I have to get revenge for this one person that they're willing to put the lives of other people on the line. Not on the line, but just cut that entirely. Yeah. And that that is a certain sense of greed. You know, there's not, I mean, you do see in nature like animals that do kill each other for entertainment, but that's not really the norm of nature. You know, there's killing for survival, and then there's personal bullshit that in the grand scheme of things is ultimately quite petty. Well, yeah, and that's that's clearly shown in the scene where Hugh has that first interaction with abandoned Pawnees, Native American guy, uh, Mm -hmm. who's eating the the bison or buffalo. I, I don't know, I get those mixed up. I do too. But he's eating the the bison or buffalo, probably buffalo. And Leonardo DiCaprio is trying to like ask him for food. And when the guy clearly sees that he's not a threat, he gives him food. Right. And they're able to have this communication with each other. Whereas if he were going to do the exact same thing, if he were Native American to the white settlers, they would have shot they would have shot him or they would have fucked around with him this film did not it neither shied away from nor entirely focused or focused too much i would say on the historical brutality uh that native americans had to deal with um 
I will say the French were especially put into a negative light in this film, though. Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah, if there wasn't really anything gonna, redeeming about the French. Yeah, if you were you were gonna say uh, <clears throat> throw in who's put in the most negative light, it would definitely be the French. Definitely. Although my thing is that you know I said there's a duality in all these different situations. The only exception really is Tom Hardy. It, it, it's not that his greed or his bastardliness or whatever the fuck is too over the top because I think it's all quite understandable to a certain extent. But that's all there is to him. So by the end of the movie, you're just like, yeah, fuck that guy. You know, there's never a time when you're like, no, I understand you. You know, I mean, we all see those people that we think are like that. But, you know, I I think the movie could have done better to make him more well-rounded besides the my buddy found God and God is a squirrel story. Just because there are people that exist in the world that seem to have one simple look on reality, when it comes to film, those characters are usually boring. And so, I mean, I wouldn't say that Tom Hardy's character in particular was boring, but his character he wasn't could have been compelling much more either. Interesting. Well, it's because when it comes down to the fight of Leo versus Tom, there is no being torn about it there there is just isn't and it should be when you're coming down to this because in every single circumstance and i I could get into this later about how you just basically see the same fight over and over and over again in this film to a very good effect that that's a compliment to the film but yeah once it comes mirrors the bear fight yeah that's what i want to get into is you see that bear fight over and over again in a good way But when it comes down to that, in every instance, there's... I kind of feel like each time you see that fight, you see it from a different perspective and you see something new. And when it happened between those two, I didn't see that because I just didn't give a fuck about Tom Hardy. I wanted that fucker to go down. And then once that actually happened, I was just like, I really shouldn't have been like that. You know, because you have the fight of bear versus man. And you're very clearly rooting for the man, not just because he's man, but also because he's Leonardo DiCaprio. And you're just thinking, he's not going to fuck with you, Bear. Don't fuck with him. Just leave him alone. Just go. Just not this guy. You know, like, you know, they're just like, not this guy. Just don't do it. You don't have to do this. But then later, you see the fight with the buffalo and the wolves. And you realize, like, it's not about this guy. There is no, oh, but but not this one. You know, you can't, no one's picked out. It's just the place and the time. Leo was between a mother and her cups. There is no right or wrong in that particular fight. There is just her versus him with their own personal agendas, but no one is right or wrong. You know, and then you have the situation with the buffalo and the wolves where you're not particularly rooting for one or the other, but you realize, like, the wolves gotta fucking eat. The bison's got to die at some point. And the bison doesn't want to die today. And it didn't have to be that one. It could have been any of them. But that's the situation. And again, it's not a right or wrong. It really isn't. And then you have, you know, Leo versus Tom, where it's like, well, one guy's in the right, one guy's in the wrong, and the guy who's in the wrong I don't particularly like, so fuck him. I'm just like, what the fuck was I learning this whole movie? <clears throat> I will say that my, my biggest issue with uh the fight with Fitzgerald at the end was the fact that it was too satisfying like this movie has shown throughout its entirety that it's smarter than that yeah I agree and then especially at the end to just be like you're right I won't bring my boy back so I'm just gonna give you up to the Native Americans and they'll kill you and they'll kill you off screen too by the way So then, you know, Leonardo DiCaprio has this sort of Disney princess, oh, I won't kill the bad guy directly, because that's wrong. I'm just like, what the fuck? Yeah, it, it, it did seem, and I don't know if this is an MPAA thing. It might be. Um, so there, there might be another cut where they do actually show, but... You know, we're we're judging it off of what we saw. What we saw, yeah. I, I was talking to one of the cinematographers at our school today that said that there's a possibility that different people during the pre-screening saw different edits of the film. No! Yes. Oh, for fuck's sake. Okay, I've been really, really super they were annoyed, checking guys. People's, they were checking people's, like, heart monitors and stuff while watching what? the film. Yeah. 
Are you serious? Yes. Okay, guys, I've been super annoyed about this movie, actually, because I feel like we saw it opening night. We saw it Thursday night of opening weekend, and I still feel like everybody in the world has seen this movie before we have. Yeah, you know, we like, were really good did, to get on time with this did review. We, did we miss something other than a screener? <laughs> like, did other states get it well, before us? Right, that's the thing is, like, other Did Europe podcasts, get it? Other podcasters in the United States and in other countries have all had, you know, well, special pre screenings. And I'm like, whoa. Well, to be fair, there is there <clears throat> is such thing as a screener. And right now, you know, for your consideration, it's being considered for the Oscar. So obviously you um, you have some people that, that get it through that means. Uh, but right. I I really don't know how people saw it, you know, outside of there are a couple of people who watch this movie illegally. Oh, that's true. You know, which I don't really support when a movie's in the theaters. I will support it when it's in limbo. Sorry, guys. But like when a movie, when there's no way to fucking watch the movie, that that's like one time where it's like, if you don't want it spoiled, I, I'm not going to say that it's like, I'm not going to say that it's right, but I'm not going to say that I don't blame you. Well, Especially with the Oscars that likes to fucking spoil every fucking movie. Oh, that's movie. true. They really do. I'm not going to either condemn or condone it. But I will say that I understand it when you have no legal option yeah, to like see you something you like, want to support. Like, it, Well, especially like if you live in like, you know, some place you know, like in the Middle movies, East or if you live in <clears throat> fucking China where they fucking dictate like what movies come right. out. Right. If such. it's something like that where you have to get around censorship, where it's something where like you actually legally cannot get your hands on a copy of something and you want to show support and you have no legal means to do it. At that point, I have to say like, hypothetically, maybe. But I mean, at the same time, I don't know. I see some people who are, who are like... Oh, it's just pirated. I'm like, but I want to support the movie. Yeah, plus, like, why the fuck would you want to watch this on a small screen? <laughs> well, I agree with that 100%. Yeah. But so, if you saw it before saying. us, which was yesterday... Um, <laughs> the 7th. If you saw it before the 7th, and you did not see a pre-screen, tell me if City's got it earlier. Because I'm really curious. If well, you're from Chicago, the UK... Chicago is not, like, the big film city anyway yeah it's theater but yeah it's theater but not film as much that's true i mean it might have been pushed because of star wars yeah they really kind of seem like that i think that's probably they pushed as far away from star wars as they could without it missing oscar season which i which is why i technically still consider it a 2015 movie it's 2015 in the movie year calendar i think the best thing about star wars now is the fact that we might actually get good movies distributed throughout the year instead of November, December, and the beginning of January. Because... Nobody wants to compete with that. Exactly. So back to the movie. (laughs) Back to the movie. One of the things I know for a fact I didn't get was there was definitely a lot of religious themes in the film. And I am neither religious enough nor anti-religious enough to really get it especially because i was really overwhelmed by a lot of other things i was getting in the movie and it was something that during the movie i was actively like i don't understand this but that's okay it's not a thing of like tree of life where i'm like i don't get it it's just pretty what the fuck you know i can accept that i don't get it the obvious parallel and the most common for hollywood hollywood is the jesus Jesus imagery. imagery and let's face it Leonardo DiCaprio kind of looks like Jesus. You know, you in have the, the movie, beard, yeah. you have the long hair. You you have the flayed back too, which is similar to, you know, the struggles that Jesus yeah. faced. In... I, I, I get that. And I get visually the similarities. But when I think about Jesus as a person in the Bible and like the specific things he preached and the things he talked about and like the actions he took... I, I can't figure out any way to relate it to Hugh Glass. I, I, no, I, I don't think that's what the parallel is. But, I, I but think, that's it. I don't know what the parallel is. I think the I parallel is just the survival through that suffering. I think that's the only parallel. But there was so much religion. Because, I mean, you had uh, you had Fitzgerald who couldn't shut up about a religion. I couldn't even figure out if he was religious or not. Because half the time he was saying stuff in all seriousness... You know, like, um, and there was definitely a lot of religion. I mean, there was, like, 
recite the last prayer when they almost killed that kid from and one of the And at millers. the same time, there I was... will say that, like, I, I can't wait until this movie comes out on Blu-ray because I, there were several lines that I just didn't fucking understand that Fitzgerald oh, said. Oh. Yeah, because cause there were times where he was talking like so, what? like... Well, I don't know how you can pick it. Because well, how can I pick it, it when I didn't understand no, it? Like I, there were times where I okay. literally didn't understand what he was saying. Right. I mean, he he did have like a whole accent thing, but I I don't know. I didn't really have that issue. But like, you know, he he had like the prayer that he was giving when he was about to kill Hugh Glass. There was the prayer that was recited before they killed that kid from where the Millers. Um, Tom Hardy told like this whole story about his, you know, oh, I had this buddy who didn't believe in God. Just didn't believe in him. Like, it was the most incredulous thing in the world. And then he says, like, oh, but he was up in this tree and he was surviving in the forest and he found God. And God was a squirrel that he got to eat and eat the meat of. And that's how he found God. You know, and it was like, it was just a humor. It was like this humorous joke, but it was about religion. Well, and then he said he fucking cannibalized the guy. Right. And then, yeah. And I mean, you know, you've got Tom Hardy, like, saying, oh, God knows exactly what's gone down. So that seems well, to put it, religion in a very negative light, but then at the same time, you had that vision where um, where Hugh Glass is in the, the dilapidated church with Hawk, and I just didn't... I think the film is trying to tackle this idea of nihilism, of perhaps there is no God, perhaps, you know, all of this means nothing. Maybe we just exist on this earth. Maybe... All it is is nature. Like we try to find things, but there's really no reason why people are alive. Look at Leonardo DiCaprio's character. Why is he alive? There's several parts of the movie where it's like, why didn't you die? Let's get to it. Okay, he gets attacked by a grizzly bear. Very brutally. How the fuck does somebody survive that? Now, granted, this is based on true events, but how it happened in the movie... I don't see somebody surviving that. Logistically. I don't see somebody getting attacked that many times. Logistically surviving a bear attack. And then being able to kill a bear. The buckshot or what, what kind of weapon is that? He had a knife. Yeah. Well, he had, he took one shot of the bear in the head. And then he took then he well, knifed he the bear. Well, he shot the bear and then he knifed the bear. Yeah. I mean, I can get knifing the bear and stuff. But like, yeah, he killed the bear. By, like, stabbing him in the eye and stuff. But, mm -hmm. like... And I'm, then the bear rolled on top of him. And then the bear rolled on top of him, which, given his condition, his chest probably would have caved in. Based on the bear's weight. But, but even in the sense of the movie, let's count the cost at that point. Yeah. You know, his back... And shoulders and chest are completely splayed open. His neck has been completely ripped out to the point where he can't talk and he's just bleeding and spurting out blood. He's bleeding blood everywhere. His leg is fucking broken. It is clean fucking broken. That's just the way it is. You know, he's been ripped up all up and down his arms. And then he had a fucking grizzly bear fall on top of him, which probably caused some pretty intense contusions. Yeah. On top of everything else. So that's just his starting point. That's his baseline for the movie. Yeah, and I had, I had heard about the bear attack and I was a little nervous about the movie because I thought that was going to be the big thing in the movie. I thought that it was going to be all this stuff, then a bear attack. But no, they, <laughs> they do the bear attack like right at the beginning of the movie. So like it's, it's not that much of a spoiler. No, it really isn't. Um, that be, <laughs> that being said, um, as the film progressed, the plausibility of it teetered at many points where it's like, there were some points that seemed very realistic where the way he was walking seemed like, or not walking, but like crawling along seemed like that's the way he probably would have to. Um, there were all these scenes where he was eating that seemed pretty realistic. There were times where his wounds would just pop open. He had um, freaking gangrene at certain points. Yeah, um, and that was something. <laughs> gangrene yeah. is no fucking joke. Frostbite and, is no fucking joke. Okay, so here, here are the risks that he, that he ran into. Gangrene, frostbite. 
hypothermia, drowning, malnutrition, malnutrition getting attacked by anything and I, everything. I, what I'm shocked by is that he wasn't riddled full of a fucking infection. Yeah, that is the you've most implausible dirt, thing. You've got in the dirt, movie. grass, water, algae. Um, you've got his clothes that are ripped to shreds and covered in blood that he's wearing day in and day out. You know, you've got all this this stuff that's like being put through his body that he's probably not really that used to. I mean, I know he's a settler, but I mean, is that something? Well, no, no, no. That, I I take that back. Actually, he he might have had a, actually a very good immune system, considering the fact that he was a survivalist before the movie even began. Yeah, he, he had was, to show people he, around because he was the only pe person who knew how to get people through this mess. He knew how to survive in the wilderness. He knew where he was going. So, I mean, I could kind of see maybe he could avoid infection that way. Yeah, I mean, he obviously had some knowledge on how to survive, you know, given how many things that he did in the movie. You know, like the Tauntaun scene. Right. Which, yeah, I'm going to call it a Tauntaun that could scene. Have, that could have given him bacteria if... Or not bacteria, but that could have given him some infections if his wounds were new. But if his wounds were new, but I'm, I'm but they going... weren't. They were healed up a lot by that point. Right, and I'm I'm gonna say, given the temperature, I don't know how infection works at that temperature. Like it might slow down infection and stuff like that. Which I yeah. So if <laughs> if if you're knowledge in how to survive in the wilderness when you're like completely fucked up. <laughs> Well, that's, Let us a, that's the thing. There were a lot of things I was willing... Or give a link to, like, Bear Grylls or whatever whenever he... <laughs> well, there were definitely certain things I was willing to suspend my disbelief for because they established beforehand he he knows how to do this. He has always been a survivalist. This is not new to him. He's not just some dude who randomly ended up in this situation. Out of all the people in this crew, he was the best person for that to fucking happen to at the same time, I don't think he could have been in that physical condition and survived that river. I really don't think he would have not drowned. That well, was the part where I was like... And that's one of those nope. things... That That's one of those scenes that if he doesn't drown, he gets hypothermia. Well, definitely. Because definitely. Rasputin, you know, if we're going to talk about like historical figures that fucking withstood a lot of shit, uh -huh. Rasputin was poisoned... And shot multiple and times. stabbed multiple times, thrown into a bag in the river, didn't drown, died of hypothermia. Yep. So hypothermia is a real deal and it can kill people really fast. I get that there are people who do polar bear swims, but still hypothermia can happen to you. And it can happen to you very quick. And he didn't have dry clothes to get into. Granted, he did have, like, bear skins and stuff like well, that. Well, he but... had a sopping wet bear skin he immediately threw off, and he made a tiny little fire and kept his freezing clothes on. Yeah, but I'm, I'm still gonna... I'm still gonna question the... No, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. You know, he was in that situation and totally didn't get hypothermia. Yeah, so I, I, I'll be really interested to see... Uh, somebody who's knowledge with but the I mean, art of survival or whatever it's called. Well, the other thing, called. too, was they were all pretty well, um, you know, they could all pretty much deal with the cold because we saw more than just him. A bunch of people get into that freezing cold water over and over and over again. Well, and to most be fair... Of the he... why, most of the reason why I question the drowning scene is because he would not have had the lung capacity to be able to take, like, big diver gulps of air beforehand. And he did not have any... Physically athletic capabilities to be able to swim in that. And top of that, well, the not weight even swim, of but his just support pelts, himself. The weight of his pelts would have put a serious. Right him under. Exactly. If he couldn't keep himself afloat. And I don't think he physically could have kept himself afloat in that situation with that current. No fucking way. E yeah. Anyways. That's really not even the fucking point of the movie, though. Like, let's not... Yeah, as much as we're like, but, 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 but... It's really not even the point of the fucking movie. But... But I could even see somebody arguing that maybe this movie is pro-religious and, like, God was protecting him or something like that. Yeah, I, I it guess almost you... It almost feels like a biblical story in a certain sense. Well, I mean, you have... You have... A death and resurrection thing. Okay, uh, let's get no, 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 into wait, 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 what wait. the word revenant means. 
Okay, fine. We do that. All right. So the web Merriam-Webster definition for revenant is one who returns after death or a long absence, which both apply to the character of Hugh Glass. Well, especially because everyone said he was deaf. And it also applies to his wife, mother, mama, baby, I, or baby mama. I don't, I don't know if they were married or anything, but you know, we all know who that chick is. That chick. Well, probably not under traditional Christian ideals. But like he was in love with her and all that stuff. So it would be fair to say like his wife. Okay. Yeah. I will say one of the other things I really didn't get in the movie. I do get that the the Tauntaun scene was a rebirthal. I, I see that. I don't see why it was that moment. And that's something I need to... I know I'm only going to get when I watch the movie again, and I really understand its placement in the story. But that was something I was watching, and I was like, okay, that really is about as gross as a real birth looks. You got that right. Yeah, anyone who's like, but do you want to have kids? No, because that's what it fucking looks like. Ew. No, it, it really is that gross and bloody and probably smelly, I'm sure. I thought they smelled bad, bad on, the on the outside. I mean, I guess as long as we're ripping into this amazing movie, whatever the fuck. Um, yeah, just powerful? because we rip on something doesn't mean that... Well, right. But a, as long as we're just fucking counting up all the things that it got wrong. Power quo? The fuck? I, I legitimately cannot wrap my head around who the fuck Power quo is supposed to be because I've heard synopsis of the film say, Oh, Power quo? who is um, the, the chief's daughter that he's looking for the whole movie, was that chick that the, the, the French had that they were raping and he cut the, she cut the dude's nuts off and that was her. Because, you know, you see her at the end and she's reunited with the chieftain. It was her. I'm pretty damn sure no, because from what I could tell, at the beginning of the movie, the raid happens with the Native Americans because that chief is looking for his daughter. Immediately at the beginning of the movie, that's it. He's looking for this one girl, and that's his whole mission. And he goes here, and he's looking for her, and he goes there, and he's looking for her, and he thinks that this person has her, whatever. And then he goes to the French, because in order to keep looking for his daughter, he needs more horses and more guns. They won't give him more horses, and he needs the horses. They trade a woman for the horses. And you know this, because the French dude says, bring me the girl... Those horses weren't free. So, after he's been looking for his daughter all this time, he exchanges a woman into sexual slavery in order to get these horses. So it can't be her. I don't think it was. But it can't be the wife either, because the wife ha was murdered in her village and has been dead for ten years or more, as a given estimate, because... Uh, Hawk was pretty young when she died. And in the thing, it looked like he was maybe okay, five well, you're or talking six. Okay, but... yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and like the flashbacks when his mother died, it looked like Hawk but was maybe five I, but or I six, thought they were and now just he's like teen, about, maybe, but... I thought they were just talking about that one, that one girl. But which one girl? Who the fuck is Powakwa? I, I'm definitely going to have to watch the movie over again. Cause... Yeah, because maybe, maybe I'm wrong about that. Because you're confusing the hell out of me, because I thought it was like straightforward, where it's just like, they, uh um... You thought it was the chick who got raped, right? Yeah, I thought it was the chick who got raped, and I thought that was like that's another the chick. Ending. That makes no, sense. I thought they they gave one, and I thought they there was another that they had. I thought Palakwa was the um, shit. Do you think Palakwa was the chick in the village that the the kid from where the Millers gave its food to? Possible, possibly, but she was in the village at that point, alongside all the dead bodies. So I'm pretty sure it wasn't her because she was among. You know, her tribe. All right. I, I don't know. <laughs> like, I, I'm sorry. I legitimately don't know. I'm really confused. And I was trying to pay really close attention because I wanted to see who this chick was. I, I will say that you know, one, considering of, one how of the many positives deaths? and negatives about the movie is the movie is so brutal that there are literal scenes in the movie that I don't remember very clearly because it it was just like a wash of senses. Like, something would come and then it's just, like, psh, senses, you know? Like, oh, here's, like, here's brutality. Here's this beautiful shot. And then it's just, like, what the fuck did I just watch? Like, right. And I, and I, 
that is a mark of a great movie, a movie that you have to watch multiple times to gather everything that you have. And right. yeah, I was focusing on the movie. It's just there there was a lot there in a lot a lot of little stuff. And sometimes I focus on some little things whereas some of the bigger things I I lose. Right, but there wasn't any other part in the films like any plot points or character developments that I felt like I missed out on. And considering the fact that so many of the brutal deaths that we saw on screen were because of this one woman that we have no idea who she is or where she's or like we don't know really who she is. We've All never right, seen I'm, her. I'm gonna I'm gonna shut up about that because like if it's so if somebody points it out and it's so obvious, I'm gonna like Well that's it. that's fine. I mean if it is, if <laughs> if I missed it and I was stupid, then that's okay. I can admit that, that's fine. But I, I'm seriously, I've been thinking this movie over and over and over and over again. And I can't figure out who the fuck Palakua is supposed to be. Or if it was just that the chieftain never found her. Um, that being said, okay, I'll make my last complaint. And this is really my last complaint. Um, if I could take one shot away from this entire film, it would be the stick shot at the end. I got, I got kind of pissed at that because you see... Okay, you have the setup where Hugh Glass saw the redheaded dude get killed, and he's still looking for Fitzgerald, but he's got to hide. So he takes a stick, and he just cuts one little branch off, one little branch, but not the big ones. I'm like, oh, okay, I get this. And then in the next shot, you see one figure on a horse leading another horse that's carrying a dead body. I'm like, so... You know, and then you see the figure on the horse get shot. I'm like, thanks for fucking spoiling it by telling us beforehand exactly how this happened. That, you know, he put this little stick up, you know, this dude on the stick up so it looks like he's just riding out in the open and he hides as the dead body. Like, what the fuck, movie? Why did you spoil that for So when he got shot, I was like, nothing. I got really pissed at that. I was just like... It surprised me. And I think they had to put it in the movie, regardless. I mean, granted, it surprised me, so, you know, maybe I wasn't paying as close attention as I should. But, like, um, I, I think that's something that people, upon other viewings, would see the movie and be like, where the fuck did he get the branch? No, but here's the thing I would have done. You know, he sees the avalanche fall, he's thinking... He looks up and you see a picture of him looking at the branch, but you don't know at that moment what plan he has in mind or that he's planning something. So you and then do later like, when you see the you branch, you do like a cut to the branch. You do a cut back to him. Then you have the scene. Okay, I instead see. Instead of you're... having him actually setting up the magic trick, you know, because that's what it was. It was like not seeing the trick and watching a magician explain it to you. Okay. Then it's just like, what the fuck. I think that they could have been better about them. But overall, I've, I've heard somebody say that he that um, the f the characters were too simple. And that made it less compelling. And I, with the exception of Tom Hardy, I truly disagree. I very truly disagree. Um, I, especially I think, with Hugh Glass. I, I, I think that because this movie is a rather quiet movie meaning not a lot of dialogue. I think some people might view that as being more simple than what it actually is. I mean, we got the same shit with Mad Max, too, where well, people... no, because he was like... His specific thing was he was like... So he has one... You know, he has one motivation in the film. You know, he's gonna get revenge for his kid. Simple. And I don't think that's true, because he doesn't speak very much, and he has one goal in the film. He has a lot of qualities to his personality that you know. Because he speaks through his actions. You know that he's kind, but you also know he's not naive. And you know that he, you know, he's strong and he can kill. But you also know he's not like a dickbag where he's just going to kill just because. You know, he will kill for survival. You know, he could take care of himself. But he is trusting and he is... And it's hard to say that considering, like, you see the horrible things that he does. But then you see his relationship with certain people. And... You know, you can see, like, better elements of his personality come out of that. And you also see his very outsiderness. You know, he, he is a part of his, you know, uh, European settlement. And he is a part of this Native American colony that he, you know, he was 
married into or whatever for a period of time. You know, he's a part of them, but he's also completely separated from all of them. But at the same time, it showed that he was like a soldier that killed the Native Americans, and then he felt bad about it, and then he, like, brought the kid in. Like, his son wasn't actually his son. Like, he, he had brought this kid in because he got, like, burned in the face, and he, like, cared for them. Like, he mm-hmm. killed his mom. Wait, you think he killed that woman? Yes. Uh, no. No, no, he didn't. No, because you see visions. No, you see visions of them in the field together and, like, being all happy in a family. He did kill a woman. I mean, I don't think it was her, though. Right, but. That scene where the bird comes out of her chest, I'm pretty sure. Which, by the way, one of my favorite images, like, out of all the images in this film, I love that image. I, I know it's not particularly original, but I love just how mindful. Buckley that was pulled off and it was a it was a fantastic visual metaphor i just adored it because they're like you know she's shot and it's so still and like this little thing moves and it's a fucking bird and you're like what the fuck I mean, it was wonderful i mean yeah. not really like i was like what the hell is going on i mean i got well, it this but movie was, was like, confusing because like there was like this ghost chick and then all of a sudden there's like birds coming out of people and stuff it makes no sense i i guarantee there there are a handful of people that You don't watch the movie and think that, and you can have that, but there is more to it than that. It's not just simple. (laughs) Right. You know, there's a reason to have have imagery like that. That, That's not something that people just throw in to, you know, be artsy or whatever. Well, I think there's a lot of subtext in this film that's either going to be missed out altogether or is open to interpretation. Yeah, I... And multiple viewings. I, I do believe that this film I, I know, will reward I, multiple viewings. I know I didn't see a lot of the movie. Definitely. I will say, just real quick, thank God that that kid from Where the Millers got a dramatic role. He's a good actor. When I saw him in that film, I was like, I want to see him do something better. It's, I know there's one big problem with him. And it, it is pretty difficult to overcome, even in this film. And he has very specific eyebrows it makes emoting rather difficult yeah for him but i i really liked his character a lot because unlike tom hardy he had you know he did have to defend himself when he knew he was doing the wrong thing or he knew he had done something wrong but he was a little more understandable because you know you you saw him try to do the right thing you saw him like try to like give out acts of kindness you know especially with the whole water bottle thing um you saw him like struggling a lot more with what he was doing and with with fitzgerald he was just like struggling to hide the fact that he was totally trying to do something he knew was wrong the whole movie and most of it with him is that he knew what he was doing was wrong and he thought what he was doing was wrong and he was trying to defend himself you know even to himself but that's not particularly interesting. It's a lot more interesting when, like, the quote-unquote villain actually believes that they're doing the right thing. And I think you could have done that. I think you could have. But yeah, I, I, I think there could have been some redeeming lines or redeeming actions in the film. Well, here's the I thing. always like when, when that villain... Let somebody live, and it makes no fucking sense why they did. But he, but that's the thing. Here's the thing. It's like, I was actually understanding when he was going to kill Glass. It was either him as a single individual or the rest of the survivors, including his son. And, you know, he makes a point of that. I can understand that. I can see where he can see that that is the right thing to do in that situation. When he because stabs even, the son? No! <laughs> when he's about to kill Glass. Well, yeah. And even Glass agrees. But then the problem is, is that when he's up and like, oh shit, the boy saw me. I did something wrong. I have to hide. My first instinct is, I'm just going to stab you in the gut. That must be the best thing to but, do in this situation. But, but in the scene, uh, in later in the film, he said the reason why they he did that was because he was worried that the Native Americans were like coming to like get them and like he wouldn't shut up. No, no. That's what he said. No, that's what he said, but that was a lie. Exactly. He never thought that, though. That's right, my, right, right. No, 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 okay. but that's my problem. He never really thought he was in the right. 
that makes them a lot less interesting. You're right. Just because Glass doesn't have a whole lot of dialogue, or that maybe he doesn't even talk about himself that much, doesn't mean that he isn't a distinctive personality. You know, I think he's one of the, you know, one of my favorite characters in a while. And we've had a lot of really great characters this year. Even more than I, movies. I'm not going to say we've I, had a lot I of great s- movies, but I will say characters. that this is a 2016 movie for my mind. No, it is still the 2015 movie calendar year. I, I disagree. Nope. But. I know you just want to have this movie for your birthday, but you can't. Well, to be fair, I put it on anticipated movies for 2016. You did that. I do not agree with that. Okay. 2015. Well, it came out wide release in 2016. But everybody fucking saw it in 2015. And I don't know how, how the fuck people, they saw it. How many it podcasters put it than... on like their 2015 best movies of the year? I mean, okay, come but, on. But like how many people saw it in a pre-screen? I don't know. Like, apparently, the whole fucking... World, apparently, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, that's not really about the movie. So, um, to keep it about the movie, hmm, what else to say? I don't know what else to say. That was definitely something. I just came out of this movie and I was like... Like, that, that was my entire reaction. I was actually speechless. And yeah, I have this... quickly rectified that situation, apparently. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Who's Pauco? Who's... <laughs> but, but... <laughs> Who the fuck is Pauco? <laughs> I, I did not say it right then. Sorry, I was trying to hold back a cough. <laughs> All right, so um, eh, I don't, I don't want to bring this up. I really don't want to bring this up. Hmm. Go ahead. Okay, so it's hard for me to say which is a better movie, Mad Max or Ex Machina. But to be, you know, completely biased, even though Ex Machina made me cry a little bit, Mad Max made it into my top ten favorite films of all time. It yeah. pretty much immediately, and it stayed there. So now I'm left sitting in this movie, and I'm like, "Fuck!" That's what happens. When I gotta the world use my fucking film, words. That's what happens when the world of film just opens up to you, and you start getting into this predicament of like, "What? What's my favorite?" That's why I hate that question. What's your favorite movie? That's why I break I it up. I hate in, that question. That's why I break it up into genres. No, because then when I say I can't say that, they're like, "What's your favorite genre?" And I'm like, "I no." No, but that's why that I break not an films into genres. Like, what's your favorite horror? What's your favorite sci-fi? What's your favorite action? That kind of thing. Well, that's the thing is with my top ten, they don't really have anything in common. Like, they really don't. I just basically picked my favorites that all <laughs> are something I genuinely give like five stars, including the feel star, and then. You know, are all kind of different from each other. So even if it's not really my top ten, it's a pretty good overall telling of the kind of movies I'm into. And then this movie comes out and I'm like, fuck! I mean, I really think that this could go down as one of the best films of all time. I really think it will. I I think multiple viewings might... In the same way that, like, Schindler's Could, List is one of the best films of all time, you know. I'm not going to say I, it's, I'm like, such a sin I'm going to have but. to return to this film a couple more times to gauge where exactly I place it into my opinion. You know, it could elevate, it mm-hmm. could drop. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I'll be really curious to see where it goes. yeah. I really like that one dude that he hung around with for a lot of the movie. I really like that guy. That scene, I love that scene where, you know, they're so haggard and they're going through all this shit in the world. And they're just sitting under a tree, like, holding out their tongues and trying to catch snowflakes like two little children. And that was clearly supposed to be the imagery. You know, they're sitting, so they're shorter, and, you know, they're they're supposed to be like little kids. I loved that. Oh, my God. Just, like... Ah. <laughs> you like all the stuff then. <laughs> Most brutal movie in the world. She's going to bring up a scene where guys are sticking out their tongues collecting snow. Well, it's not as if I didn't also love all the brutality of the film. Yeah. But you have to measure it out to a certain extent when you're like, well, what's the point? Yeah. What's life worth living for? I, oh, I wanted to bring this up. I actually thought that this was a great. Me oh, personally. That he was hung? No, no, just hung. Uh, hang on. Because I know you didn't see it this way, but I personally saw it this way is when um, 
you know, he... This whole horrible thing has happened to Hugh Glass, and now he's completely alone, and he's just trying to survive in the wilderness. And for a large part of the movie, I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking, you know, he's just trying to survive. And, you know, as the movie goes on, and you see him, and you see what he goes through, you're, you kind of go like, I wonder what's really going on in him, and I wonder what he's living for, and I wonder, like, what what's making him do this? And then it gets to the point where he's starting to write out the whole thing with about Fitzgerald killed my son. And then you realize how much anger he's had in him, within him this whole time. And that's what's driving him. So it took like see, maybe about half a movie for me to really see this as a revenge flick. See, but I but, liked that where, where you have that very slow, gradual progression of seeing him and learning more about him as the film goes on. And not just like he's sitting there with his son and is like, Fuck that Fitzgerald! I'm gonna go find him! You know, that... I thought that that... I don't know if that wasn't supposed to be that way, or if most people saw it that way, but I enjoyed experiencing it that way. I know you okay, didn't. Okay, well, I but, want you to go back, watch it a second time, and watch the scene where he stabs his son. He literally can't move, and he's just going... Mm, mm, no! Mm, the no. whole time. So, I, that was the moment where I'm like... Yeah, this is going to be a revenge movie. Well, I mean, part of it is finding out what kind of person Hugh Glass is. Right. We, we hadn't really seen him that much before that. We didn't well, know who and, he was as a person. And I will say that even he though... He could have been the kind of person who's like, it's not going to bring my son back. You know, like they said at the end of the movie. But that turned out to not be the case. I don't know. I like the fact that they sort of held off on that for a while. And they didn't bombard you with it for like the whole well, movie. They but waited I also like think, half a movie but to I also full think that's, on it. I also think that that scene <clears throat> is a clear indication of how humans can be better than nature. You know, the fact that humans don't have to, you know, if humans are allowed mercy. Whereas that that's not really a concept in nature. It's mm -hmm. unnatural. In pretty much all... In your opinion, sure. Yeah, I, I don't think that mercy is something that, that is a... Na mercy and forgiveness? What fucking animal does that? They might forget because they have small brains. But I don't, I don't think animals have the capability of forgiving a person. Or... Okay. But correct me if I'm wrong. I, well, I, I don't know. I don't know that much about animal psychology. But I do think that that is a, that is a distinctly human quality. That, that's what I believe. And I think the movie wanted to highlight that at the end to show but another But that wasn't aspect. mercy. Well, it was. That was not was, mercy. That's the problem with that scene. It's like, he's not like. I beat the shit out of you, I'm gonna leave you here, and you can see if you can survive. No, he sent him to his death, he just didn't do it. Okay, yeah, I, I get what you're <clears throat> saying. It, it wasn't mercy, but it was, you know, he he had to separate himself from it in order for him to survive, even though it's unclear whether or not he died at the end. Oh, yeah, let's talk about the ending. Okay, because that's something else I know I didn't get, because... I'm watching it, and, you know, he's out there, and he sees his wife, and I'm like, okay, this is going to be an ambiguous ending where you're not supposed to know whether he lives or not. I'm going to see how she reacts, and based on that, that's what I'm going to base off of whether he lives or dies. So he looks at her, and his eyes fill with tears, but then she sees him, and then she walks away, and I'm like, he lives! Okay, cool, you know, death walked away from him, and he's not going to follow her, and he's just going to be alive, you know, so he's looking after her. And then he looks right into the camera at us as if being a semi-sheltered American in modern day, I'm going to have any fucking idea how, what to say to him after that movie. I'm just like, who, me? What the fuck am I supposed to say to you? I don't know. I couldn't do that. That's something I'm going to have to watch a few more times to get. Man, what the fuck do I have to complain about compared to this? But then at the end of the movie, when he looks right at you, it kind of feels like he's like, dude, what the fuck, man? You're seriously bitching about, like, the internet going slow on your cell phone? Look at this, you know, or something. Not really. I didn't really think, like, that was the meaning of the film or anything. 
But at the same time, I don't know how the fuck to respond to that movie. I don't think the movie is asking you to respond to it. So what do you think it is? What do I think the looking at straight at the camera at the very last shot is? Yeah. Which is a movie that's that's really admired. I think that's a I think that's a reflection of human nature. Like it's you know, that he's looking into a reflection of humanity instead of us. Right. Or we see him as a reflection of humanity. We see okay. him as a reflection of humanity. Okay. Like it's like the whole film is a culmination of, you know, all that humanity has to offer, including the natural, unnatural, the the selfish and the loving. Okay. You know, the giving. I, I can see that. That makes a lot of sense to me. And oftentimes when you're at connection with something, something that's different from humans than animals is the fact that a connection is made when eyes meet. Animals don't make connections when the eyes meet. Animals move their eyes away, whereas humans have the connection with their eyes meeting. Generally, that's true. There's one major exception, but there's a biological reason for it. Okay, well, you brought it up, so what's, what's the exception? Well, dogs and humans, but a big part of it is because domesticated dogs have been bred to interact with humans in a specific way that they do not interact even with each other. And one of those ways is eye contact. But I think that that point notwithstanding, what you're saying makes a lot of sense. And I agree with that. All right, so just bear with it. I made that joke to you and then you just fucking stole it. Fuck you, man. Just bear with me. Oh yeah, I did I did tell you that this was a much better human beings turning into bears movie than Brave ever was. <laughs> <laughs> and I will also say that if you ha- have not seen the movie and you're listening to this review, there there's some stuff online that literally said that the bear raped Leonardo DiCaprio, which no, that there, did not happen. There is a small portion of their fight where it looks a little bit, not really in the moment because you're swept up with it, but it looks a little bit like she's humping him. That's not really what's happening. But it's one of those things where, like, you don't see it in the movie. But if you were to isolate just, like, this 0.5 seconds of footage and put it into a GIF on loop, it would look kind of like that. There it's only no a matter of time. Raping. It's only a matter of time before that becomes a a gif. Gif. Yeah, but um, that being said, there is no bear raping. That doesn't happen. Humanity gets raped instead. Well, human does, I guess. Plus, no, I mean like the concept of humanity. Yeah. Well, the concept of the word rape. We we have turned rape <laughs> into a word that only means sexual violence but that's not what rape actually means oh i see what you mean yeah okay yeah rape means to take away right or you know in some cases you know you might refer to the destruction of the forest as the rape of the forest like if you were writing a sonnet about it or something yeah Yeah, but (laughs) that is that is still technically correct yeah that is linguistically correct yes that was a weird side tangent okay I th- I think I'm about done for now from my first feeling. Um yeah, I I would love to communicate with some people, um address some of the things that we missed the first time, which of course, you know, with I a film like really this. I think really a lot. I I really can't wait to see it again. I want to see it again now. I want to <laughs> see it again tomorrow. I want to see it again the day after that. Like this is just a movie I want to sit around and just watch just com- over and over. Yeah. Yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to revisiting this film. And I think maybe some people are like, but it's so horrible and violent. Well, yeah, but A, that's life, and B, I mean, I like that in, in media, so it's okay. I can have shit like that on repeat and it won't bother me too much. Even though, like I said earlier, there were parts where I was like, no! Um, specifically the cauterizing scene. Holy shit. Oh, where he took the gunpowder no! and put it... Stop it. To snack. No. Lit it. No. Stop it. <laughs> no. Oh, that that's that was so brutal. Oh, that was one of the worst. Cause that was 
I, I have a hard time with, with scenes where somebody has to do something like that to themselves. Because I, oh my god. And I will say the amazing thing in this movie is there was like never a cutaway. In almost every single case, and I think I mentioned that. Before. Oh yeah, every time where there was blood or special effects like that, it was always part of like a really long take. So you know that they had to be prepared for that the whole time they were doing that scene. Yeah, this would be a great film to see the behind the scenes and how they did it. I want to see how they did that bear fight. Yeah, I, I think it was probably like a puppet and CGI. Well, like a green green puppet that like picked him up and shook him around or something. Maybe it's one of those crane arms, like in the crane machines. Well, maybe it was a doll <laughs> at some point, like Leonardo. Leonardo, he was a doll. Or maybe it was a large puppet. Like I'm trying to figure it out. Well, the way I think about it is, I think about like when I was thinking about how they could do this. What came to my mind was um some of the the effects that they did for the Alice in Wonderland movie, where they built like for example when you have the shot where She's flying around on um, the Mad Hatter's hat. They built a giant top hat, painted it in green screen, and stuck what's her face like on the brim of it, and they had it like rotate and move around like that. Like that's how they shot it. So my inclination is that it was something kind of like that. I don't know if that's true or not. I'm really interested to see how they did that. I really, 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 really want to know. So, um, in the comments below, uh, let us know what you think. You can also email us at allwalksoffilm at gmail.com. That's no spaces, by the way. Um, also, if, if you want to talk about anything from survivalism, um, you know, what the movie got right, what the movie got wrong. Um, what we got right or wrong. Yeah, what, what we but got right or wrong. There were things that we didn't touch upon or we were like, yeah, but we didn't really get it. You know, talk to us about like theory and stuff. That's really interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Um, interpretation is um, always, always great to discuss. And we'll definitely bring it up in the next episode. So yeah. I'm hoping to see lots of comments below. Yeah. All right. Thanks for listening. <laughs>